Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Daniel Oliveira. I'm the Associate Director for Funded Studies here at CII. And I have the privilege to work with academics, you know, at UT Austin and across the country. And it's a pleasure to have Chris Rauch here today with us. He's an uh, assistant professor here at UT Austin in the Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering Department. Um, <clears throat> Chris brings us brings a mix of industry and academia experience. He has a, a PhD from the University of Waterloo. Um, and, and then he worked with Z Modular um, for a while before joining us here. So I'm excited, you know, to, to bring him here today to talk about dimensional control and um, I'll let him tell you more about his background and then um, present his, his, uh, his slides. Thank you, Chris, for being here and thanks everybody here today for, for attending the webinar. Thanks, Daniel. A quick audio check. I'm good to go. You're good. Perfect. All right. Okay, well, I will begin. Well, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in, uh, whether you're uh, watching live or on uh, demand. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about some of the, the work that I've been involved in in the last eight years or so. Um, and the topic is dimensional control strategies in modular construction. Um, as Daniel noted, I've got a, a mix of academic and industry experience. Um, currently in my research group here at the uh, University of Texas, um, I am kind of building upon some work I've done in modular construction. And I'm also having a, a dual focus on uh, materials reuse, so the circular economy. And uh, one of the grand kind of visions of this work is to hopefully see um, it come to fruition where we see an intersection of these two fields of industrialized construction um, and uh, the circular economy. Uh, but for today, I'm going to talk about some very practical um, you know, aspects of my work. And on the next slide, I have a, a brief uh, introduction to kind of uh, uh, guide us through today's talk. So I'm going to start by talking about you know, what is and why is dimensional control uh, important for modular construction. And really, my experience comes from a very specific you know, part of construction, um, that being residential and, and commercial construction. Um, and, and through the course of, of different projects that I've worked on, either directly or um, indirectly, I've realized that there's a real role uh, for dimensional control. And uh, what, I, what I hope you can walk away with is, is this idea that dimensional control should be thought of um, across the life cycle of a project. And um, I hope that you can also walk away with some practical tools that you can use on your projects, and um, as well as, as how to best structure uh, a dimensional control strategy. Um, I, as I mentioned, my direct experience comes from residential and commercial construction, and I'm you know, fully aware that CAI is, is uh, very broad uh, in its applications. And so in an attempt to kind of make it relevant to, to uh, the majority of CAI members, um, I'm hoping to kind of uh, kind of tailor this talk to specific uh, facets of residential and commercial modular construction um, that might uh, pertain more so to capital projects and industrial construction. And I think the way um, perhaps to best do that is by talking about dimensional control on structural assemblies. Um, I think that this is kind of a, a direct overlap between these fields. Um, and as well, I'll talk about some um, of the other things that kind of relate to more physical interfaces between um, assemblies. So you can think like uh, pipes um, as well as um, structural systems. So what is dimensional control and, and why is it important? Um, well, you know, it's no surprise that we design construction projects in a, in a highly idealized manner. You know, we want our bri bridges, buildings, um, and facilities to operate in a, in a suitable way. And while we make a, a lot of assumptions um, and intentions about uh, the dimensions and geometry of materials, in reality, all dimensions and positions of installed materials vary somewhat. And one of the examples that I, I like to talk about when um, giving people kind of a, a very introductory you know, discussion about dimensional control is I bring up the example of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I think that that's um, something that is, uh, as, you know, visually you can, you can understand. But I think it, it, the interesting thing about this project is that, you know, in many ways, it, it describes an approach to construction that we still see to this day. Um, even though it was built, you know, in the 1100s and 1300s. And, you know, my understanding is that, you know, this particular building had dimensional um, control problems in that the foundation was settling. And so, you know, the building itself had some, some lean to it. And the approach that was taken to control or to kind of rectify the situation was to um, come up with an in situ or reactive kind of measure to correct 
that alignment of the building over time. And uh, I, 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 do, I do note, and I find it interesting that I think in many ways, we approach our construction problems um, in the same way of, of trying to come up with reactive solutions. Um, and so this is, you know, perhaps a, a one way to describe, you know, the importance of dimensional control. You know, we want our, our facilities and our, and our um, assets to perform in a certain way. Um, through the course of my work, I've, I've focused on this idea of dimensional control, um, specifically in modular construction. And I think that comparing modular to non-modular construction, there's an increased awareness and need for dimensional control. And so some of the things that can go awry in terms of, um, you know, what I'll call risk related to dimensional variability are things like um, uh, gaps between tie-in points and, and connection points, as well as, um, you know, components just not coming into proper alignment, whether that be, you know, at a very local level or, or something that's very obvious, like a, a gap being left. In modular construction, again, kind of tying into some of the experiences that I have uh, more so in residential and commercial, um, if, if modules have uh, geometric variability, sometimes enclosing the facade can have challenges. So the, these two images here show, um, the image on the left shows where a, a facade panel between a mate line of modules um, could not be installed properly. Um, as well, other risks are more aesthetic based. So if you've got mate lines that have, you know, very noticeable shifts, um, it's, it's uh, not aesthetically pleasing. Um, arguably, when um, dimensional variability impacts the structure, um, that's probably the biggest uh, problem that we can have on, on a project. And we can talk about whether uh, dimensional variability is accumulating or causing problems in a sort of horizontal direction or even vertically. And apart from the practical aspect of when modules may not fit together or, or have uh, dimensional control problems that you know um, cause issues um, quite literally between the interfaces, sometimes we can actually change the load paths if it's really, really significant. Um, and and even the, the level of rework that's required to bring things into proper alignment can add residual stress to structures that can um, cause issues. And, and oftentimes we don't anticipate that or design in those residual stresses. And so it's important to at least understand what impacts dimensional variability can have. And in you know, some of the projects that I've worked on, I've seen it have different, you know, uh, impacts, whether it be on the structure, um, on the constructability, just bringing things into proper alignment. The constructability part um, ends up, you know, causing cost and, and schedule overruns on projects. So as I mentioned, aesthetics, and these are just different, you know, impact areas or risks, if you will. Um, perhaps for the, um, the capital projects and industrial construction industry, um, serviceability and functionality of equipment might be a, uh, another concern. And so the, these are just different examples of, of, I guess, risk categories. And so as a result, there's a need to come up with dimensional control strategies to ensure that, you know, our project performs in a, in a suitable manner. And so as I, as I mentioned, I come with a, you know, very specific kind of um, experience. So some of the projects that I've worked on directly or indirectly are modular data centers, uh, temporary commercial buildings, multifamily, hospitality, um, even modular um, home building applications, and even you know the, going on more of a single family approach, um, even accessory dwelling units. And so across these, I, I, I guess realized that there is a, a big need to control um, dimensions and geometry to ensure um, you know projects perform um, suitably and that they are you know delivered on on time and on budget. And so through some of my work, I, I came up with different types of dimensional control strategies. And, and some of these are um, original, um, whether it be, you know, myself working with um, other researchers or, or, you know, piloting things in industry. Um, a lot of it's just things that I've seen, quite frankly, too. And I think that uh, we can think about dimensional control as this um, thing that exists across the life cycle. And so in, in uh, my uh, webinar today, I'm going to talk about some of the um, different facets of dimensional control that pertain to uh, the design stage, as well as uh, fabrication and assembly, and on-site construction. Um, when talking about dimensional control during design, you know, we're often trying to focus on modeling, on simulating, and optimizing the design itself um, to ensure that, you know, we've got uh, an effective, you know, um, protocol in place to avoid certain types of risks that can occur. 
during fabrication and assembly uh, and on-site construction, these are the actual you know, building stages of our project. And dimensional control has a, a role here um, in the form of planning, monitoring, and mitigating risks you know, as they arise. And you know, my message, and, and hopefully what you can take away in learning, is that addressing dimensional control should not be thought of as, as a sort of siloed exercise. Um, although unfortunately, in most you know, cases, we, we have to react and, and come up with you know, strategies in, in very much a siloed manner. Um, if we can think about dimensional control as, as spanning our, the entire life cycle, I think that that really unlocks a, a, an ability to you know, achieve um, dimensional precision that's required to have modular construction be successful. And so in that kind of life cycle view, um, the, the purpose of, of dimensional control should uh, try to anticipate pr uh, something called process capabilities. And this comes from the manufacturing industry, but if we can have process capabilities that are well understood, basically um, the way to think about that is, is how accurate you can build at, at specific stages. If you've got a thorough understanding, you can take that information up front during design and have a much more effective um, overall approach. And I am probably preaching to the choir for um, many of us who are, you know, ingrained in modular construction that this is not, um, you know, in any way unique to dimensional control, but it is uh, something that is a very effective project management approach to just have, you know, an integrated approach um, for project delivery. Uh, what I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to talk about some of the interesting things that I've seen um, and worked on that relate to each of these key life cycle stages. And so I'll start by talking about some of the dimensional control strategies that are used for on-site construction. And I think these tend to be more reactive in nature. And I think that, you know, from what I've seen, um, the, the analogy I like to think about is that in the field, we're, we're often having this firefight uh, mentality where, you know, fires, you know, uh, pop up and they need to be put out in order to keep the project moving successfully. And so it's a very, you know, unique type of, of skill and, and art really to um, correcting issues that arise. But it does, it does tend to be reactive in nature. And I think that if we can move you know, and be more proactive, I think that it can help us um, achieve the same result in a much more cost and schedule um, effective way. But nonetheless, um, some of the things that we, we see on site for reactive strategies are things like reaming bolt holes, um, adding shims if, if there's gaps that are left between uh, modules, as well as trimming parts. Um, adding grouting. Grouting is an interesting um, strategy in that you can actually design in uh, and anticipate there being a gap. And obviously, sometimes it's easier to add more material than it is to remove materials. So grout is both a reactive strategy, but it can also be something that is designed into the overall process. Um, something related to steel structures that is quite common is if there's problems on site, the use of a, a come along um, or or large you know uh, cranes to to rack structures is something that is um, unfortunately quite common. Um, and I think the reason for a lot of these strategies arises because there is sort of two levels of accuracy at play. We have on one hand, the tolerances and the dimensional control that's used to build um, site components. So you can think like the foundation and the level of accuracy that's um, assigned to you know, stick built or, or site built components is usually you know, much more loose than those types of tolerances and dimensional control capabilities that um, are associated with the, the manufactured modules themselves. And so this, I guess, gap between these levels of precision is often what is um, the reason for and, and you know, what, what causes a lot of problems that require some sort of a um, dimensional control strategy to exist. Um, one of the things I've been a big advocate for is rather than you know, solely relying on you know, purely mechanical means and, and methods to achieve dimensional control is to integrate the use of digital technology to help inform decision making. And so one of the very practical ways of uh, using digital technology is to collect as-built data of your site as it's being built as well as perhaps um, your, your modules that are being built and to try to understand you know, whether your site is within compliance. Again, the reason that uh, we often see this, this gap exists is because the level of, of precision that is uh, achieved on site is usually much um, you know, uh, looser or not as accurate as what can be achieved in the plan. And so simply getting as-built data about our site can at least inform us how accurate that site is to begin with. Um, and it can also be used as a really effective tool for understanding if we need to take kind of corrective measures before um, setting modules. 
And so some of the, the, the ways that um, you know, this might come to fruition are things like isolated peers. And so you can imagine having kind of a, a at least in one example of a foundation system, having isolated peers that if you could collect as-built data and you know, even, you know, even virtually simulate the, the assembly process, it allows you to be able to assess if you've got you know, particular peers or parts of your foundation that are out of tolerance. And in some cases, you, know, you can correct those uh, parts of the foundation ahead of bringing modules to site so that your schedule is not impacted. You know, a big part of modular construction is this idea that we can parallelize our process. So we can do work on site while we're doing it off site. And, and oftentimes the time it takes you know, to do the site work is, is not the same as the time it takes to do the, um, the off-site work. So if there are gaps in the schedule, at least understanding if we need to take corrective measures is really uh, informative. And there's also sometimes too, um, for instance, I show you know, these, these, uh, the middle part of this foundation is being out, but if it happens to be you know, part of the, the foundation where you start your module setting process, if you don't know that that part is out and you start setting and, and you think that you know, 95% of your foundation is out, whereas in reality, those, that starting point of your foundation is out, um, then you can at least be able to assess, okay, well, maybe if we come up with a different approach to module setting, we can minimize some of these conflicts. And so the kind of takeaway message here is that by at least bringing some form of, of digital technology into the um, process of on-site construction, it can be a very powerful tool for correcting dimensional control problems. Some of the interesting thing that I've done from a research standpoint is um, answering the question of, well, you know, what if, what if the problems are not between the site and your modules? What if they're actually between the modules themselves? And what if the level of accuracy for producing the modules has a lot of variability? And so I looked at a method that, you know, looks at a very, you know, niche or specific application, um, um, you know, uh, continuous modules that are, uh, at least in theory, identical. But if you could scan them ahead of time and understand their unique geometry, um, it allows you to plan um, how to mix and match interchangeable modules. And so the example that I've you know looked at at a very you know practical level was um, steel components for a bridge that um, were assembled into modules. And if these were in theory um, supposed to be identical modules, but because of dimensional variability, they all you know physically exist as you know being slight variations of each other by getting as built information, you could plan and optimize that assembly to minimize rework. And then looking at how this could apply to broader applications, you could think of, you know, um, identical curtain panel assemblies, as well as perhaps um, pods or, or um, units that are prefabricated that go into a um, existing building. Even things like, you know, um, pipeline transmissions or pipe spools. You know, if in theory you've got um, repetitive modules, you could scan them and understand the unique geometries of each individual module to optimize. And in some ways, in, in some cases, we, we you know, produce modules and have just-in-time delivery, so this is not always pertinent, but there are definitely some, some interesting applications that if you collect ASBEL data, um, you can optimize and, and kind of minimize any, any problems that could arise if you just you know, proceed it as is. And so now I'm going to move on to talking about some of the strategies that we can use during fabrication and assembly. And I think a lot of this comes from the mentality and the approaches that we take for on-site construction um, and, and look at bringing that into the manufacturing facility. Again, with the focus of trying to plan and monitor and mitigate risks that are created as we uh, build and as we go. And so through the course of working on some projects and, and kind of what I've seen through the literature of, of different studies, um, I've kind of uh, come to about four different unique steps that are really important um, for achieving good dimensional control during fabrication and assembly. And these are, are, you know, things that I've seen in my experience, so by no means are they um, exclusive or exhaustive, but um, getting into them, the first thing is, is to collect good data to understand um, both what is, but also um, assessing the impact of process capabilities. And really, this is trying to understand how accurate each, each part of the fabrication and assembly process is. The second is then, based on that process capability that you can, you can benchmark or establish, to either select new equipment or revise processes to achieve dimensional accuracy that's required. 
And then the third step is to come up with a really robust dimensional quality control or quality assurance um, process that is cost effective. And I put that kind of note there, cost effective, because I think that a good quality control process should um, encompass both accurate measurements um, as well as more semi-accurate. And I think that really the, the takeaway message of what I've seen is that you need both good, really accurate information in some cases, but because of the expenses and um, the time that is required to use this, you probably don't want to use that on an ongoing basis. And so having um, kind of that canary in the coal mine, um, you know, being brought onto your project in the form of semi-accurate or, or cheaper and faster measurement techniques um, that you use on, on an ongoing or an always basis tends to be much more cost effective and you can use those semi-accurate um, methods to tell you if you need to bring in that more accurate uh, measurement technique to verify or validate things. And then because you know modular construction often uh, encompasses mass manufacturing or at least it has the ability to achieve that, um, it's important to continuously improve and to benchmark processes over time. And so what I'm gonna do is just briefly break down some of these steps in a bit more detail and give some examples. So on the collecting data, you can look at your overall you know, modular process in a, in a factory, and you can break down each of the key stages. Perhaps this is done by different trades or it's done you know, within and under one roof, so to speak. But you can stop at each of these main stages and, and begin to quantify and understand um, the geometry, but also the individual processes that influence and impact that geometry. And so one example that I've seen you know, over and over again is the need to make sure that your structure, uh, which tends to be the starting point for a lot of off-site fabrication work, making sure that structure itself is produced accurately in the first place. You can imagine that if looking at stage two here, the, the MEP subsystems or mechanical equipment, if you're relying on that structure to provide a reference point or a datum, and that structure itself is not accurate, you can imagine that all resulting work afterwards is gonna carry on that inaccuracy. And, and obviously, you know, outside of just making sure that these um, subsequent stages um, proceed without rework, we need to make sure that once we bring all this to site that everything stacks together properly. And so focusing on the structure tends to be a very key area for ensuring good dimensional control. And so what you could do is you could break down that overall structure into a, a sequence of sub-steps. And again, at each of these, you could digitize or get as-built information um, to understand the accuracy and the process capability of each of these um, fabrication steps. And that, be, and that I guess, becomes a, a benchmark uh, or a tool to assess and understand perhaps specific substages here, which introduce more variability and, and which might need to be revised or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, have a, a unique dimensional control strategy to ensure that the overall build process is, is okay. One of the interesting things that I've seen in, uh, going back probably four or five years ago was working with a contractor which um, as part of their um, manufacturing uh, state step they had uh, steel flooring with with precast concrete panels that were supposed to be installed and by digitizing and understanding the process capabilities we were able to assess that um, the issues that they were having so the panels weren't fitting in the frame um, it was not necessarily a result of the inaccuracy or the process capabilities of the precast panels and in fact, it was more so the amount of, of welding, the uh, approach to welding the base frame. And so it was causing a lot of weld distortion. And so just by simply getting information on, on the, the floor, the steel, as well as the precast panels, we could begin to point to the cause of these issues. And so in summary, you know, during this, this step of understanding and collecting um, data, it's important to make sure that you're collecting good and rich data. So spending the money up front, you know, on a prototype that goes through your plant is well worth the investment. And it's probably best to not just quantify a single um, prototype, but to collect data over, you know, multiple assemblies, because, you know, the more data that you can get, it'll help inform and, and give you a better sense of what your true process capabilities are, and not just perhaps um, what ended up happening on one unique module. So moving on to talking about then once you've established what your process capabilities currently are, um, you can then bring in and, and, and devise a kind of an overall um, approach to selecting equipment that will allow you to achieve the dimensional accuracy that you need. And one of the things that you often see in, in a lot of facilities is the use of mechanical jigs and fixtures. 
to ensure that what you're building is built in an accurate manner. And um, you'd be surprised though that just by simply buying mechanical jigs and fixtures does not guarantee you're gonna have accurate product. And so um, kind of coupled with the equipment that you source and use, you've got to know how to use it. Um, and, and that can be um, kind of a combination of seeing and quantifying product that gets put through um, you know, these mechanical systems but perhaps you might need to actually change what types of, of systems as well. So whether that be a two-dimensional jig or even a three-dimensional jig. And so this tends to be something that is tailored to unique types of products and projects. Um, but again, having that, that starting point, your process capabilities, and, and monitoring that over time allows you to assess whether you're using the equipment um, properly. I'll then move on to talking about, you know, uh, de developing an actual quality control and quality assurance process. And one of the things that is kind of fundamental for this step is to bring in technology that can help you digitize. So this, you know, um, a lot of these steps, one, two, three, and even four, um, rely on um, different technologies to actually assess and to quantify the geometry and to kind of quickly give a, a brief kind of snapshot of different technologies that can be used on your project. We can look at the layout of, of datums and grid lines on site. So this would be more so pertinent to the foundation work, um, but the use of total stations and a, a robust system. So not, you know, in modular construction, it's probably not suitable to just use, you know, wood stakes to lay out grid lines. Um, you need to have permanent monuments that do not move and that will ensure um, that your grid lines are much more accurate than, you know, traditional non-modular approaches. During the plant, um, stages, you can use different types of technologies that allow you to lay out and to communicate the design in a more effective and intelligent manner. And some of the more innovative types of technologies that are starting to come on the market are things like laser projectors. So you could take the design information and you could project it physically on the workpiece to see and assess whether or not, um, you know, workers or, or equipment is building accurately. And then you can perform either, you know, um, VR-based or AR-based assembly, but but probably more so quality assurance techniques. And really, <clears throat> excuse me, really the idea here is that it's better to avoid problems than to try to fix non-compliance. And so having technology that can help you um, carry out the work is is very you know important, but but also you know equally um, so having quality assurance is um, still you know fundamentally required. And so having dimensional quality assurance. Things like laser scanners are becoming more and more popular and common, um, as well as when you need to have increased accuracy, things like laser trackers. So this just gives a, a very you know, broad overview of some of the technology that you could bring into your project for various um, aspects of quality control and quality assurance. So finally, um, you know, what is the value of, of benchmarking and continuously improving? Well, maybe you may not get it right on the first um, product that you put through your, your facility. And if you're, either building you know, repetitive product or using repetitive processes, having a way of benchmarking and understanding and making continuous improvements is, is you know, by far probably one of the best strategies. And it's really rewarding to see this happen. And so a couple of years back, I, I was working with a contractor where um, they were mass producing certain types of modules and they used a, a pilot to understand how to revise or reset up their, their facility. And, uh, between two projects, there was a, a significant improvement by just very simple things. Um, so, for instance, when they were doing work on um, an I-beam-based uh, modular structure, they realized that they had to keep the floor really um, planar. And by having four supports resulted in a lot of sag that locked in bad geometry. Um, and so, as a result, they brought in um, the use of more uh, fixture cables to ensure that the, the floor was kept more accurate so that all of the vertical work um, was kept plumb. And as a result of these changes that were continuously brought on board, um, on the first you know, iteration of the project, there was all sorts of issues resulting in large gaps between tie-in points. And those you know, quickly were eliminated uh, on subsequent projects. So that kind of just gives you a brief overview of some of the strategies that can be used um, to, to plan and to monitor and to mitigate risks as they happen. But what I'm going to talk about kind of to wrap up my, my talk here is moving to be more proactive. And this tends to be something that um, is addressed more so during design. And it's also perhaps the most challenging thing to actually implement and practice because it tends to be more um, theory based. And it really still relies on having good quality control during fabrication and assembly and on-site construction. But nonetheless, I'll talk about this um, very briefly here. 
So during the design, um, the purpose of dimensional control strategies is to really model and simulate and to optimize the design itself. And to do that, you have to have a good understanding of where variability can be introduced in your project, whether that be on, on geometric design parameters, so things like the dimensions and the tolerances perhaps that you bring on board, but it's also important to understand the geometric responses of modules to things like transportation and handling loads, um, as well as how you build on site. And what I, what I tend to see um, being used in practice from a design standpoint is the use of tolerances. And I'm not sure if the, if the best way to describe this is, is more of an afterthought or a, a, um, a contract kind of liability um, vehicle, but the use of tolerances tends to be um, something that's brought on, on board to um, protect or ensure that the, the design work itself is not going to be responsible for causing issues. And so across a lot of you know, non-modular trades and, and disciplines and practices, there's a lot of guidance and kind of reference standards for tolerances, but there tends to not be too many um, dimensional tolerance standards that are modular specific. And even if there are some um, kind of reference points, I think that the topic of tolerances is very unique to um, your individual projects and, and products that you're building. And so the determination of acceptable limits or tolerances, you know, tends to be something that has to be developed on a very kind of nuts and bolts level, sometimes quite literally, um, as shown here. And, and you know, I, I don't know if this is something that is, is um, you know, broadly, you know, applied because of how time intensive it is. But if you can get down to the nuts and bolts level of understanding and defining acceptable limits, then at least you can um, get a good, uh, I guess, uh, communication to your, your, um, your, your building trades, you know, those um, trades that are, are working in a plant and, and as well as on site to understand, you know, which limits um, actually need to be maintained and not just those that are established because they exist in some standard or some reference point. And this topic of tolerances is also compounded in complexity because while we can specify tolerances on a parts level, how do we go about even understanding how to how this kind of builds into an accumulation or a stack up effect. And this, this challenge is something that I think is, is piloted and, and addressed very well in, in more, you know, mainline um, manufacturing industries that, that mass produce products, but applying this to, you know, more larger civil applications or, or you know, structural systems tends to be very complex. And so a shameless plug to some interesting work that I've done in this area, um, primarily from a research standpoint is looking at, different models that can be used to simulate or to understand the accumulation effects of tolerances. And so some of the things I looked at are, you know, applying an analogy of, of kinematics chain, uh, chains to structural systems. The idea here is that you break down your overall build process to, um, you know, understand the position of, of very specific uh, components. In this case, it was tie-in plates between modules. Again, I, I, I discussed how I think the, the mainline manufacturing um, industries are, do a really good job of, of this idea of, of simulating the, the built uh, procedure of products. And there's a lot of different approaches that exist. One of the things that I've seen that's very effective is the use of kind of 3D simulation tools. So things like Monte Carlo simulation. Um, this slide here, hopefully the video is coming through okay, but it shows the simulation of a build procedure for a computer mouse. And what you're seeing here is actually every single individual um, three-dimensional part is moving in its shape and, and each part is defined to have some limits of variation and by simulating this in a you know a software application you can get some really interesting insight into um, you know the statistical performance of how you build again looking at localized variations but that overall propagation effect and some research i looked at applying this to, to structural systems and, and the way that, that I approached that was taking kind of discrete tolerances and saying, well, in reality, a dimension is probably not going to be plus or minus a value. It's, it's going to have some st uh, statistical distribution. And I, obviously, I pulled this not from um, my own original sourcing, but I, this is something that, that is seen in more um, you know, mainline manufacturing applications. But if you can develop these statistical distributions and integrate that into the assembly sequence, it allows you to um, statistically, I guess, simulate um, tolerance accumulation. And I think what I, I think the value of this for the construction industry is not necessarily in taking the time on an ongoing basis to simulate every single product that we're building, 
but it's to understand which processes in general are better performers than others. And, and so, you know, I've, I've looked at some very, you know, uh, unique applications of this, but some of the challenges with applying this to larger civil structures as compared to more um, smaller products is the impact of, um, you know, elastic behavior of structures. And so there are some, you know, software out there, and I, I kind of point to, to one here that's used in, in the manufacturing industry, but integrating finite element analysis is really something that's required if, if these kind of tools are going to be, you know, used in practice. And so I gave some examples here of just some, um, some different innovative approaches to um, kind of optimizing design, or at least having tools that can allow you to optimize design. Um, but there's also some work that I've, I've collaborated on that looks at evaluating different design philosophies. Um, that being perhaps on one hand, you could design a rigid structure that um, resists different loads during transportation and handling to make sure that that module is not having permanent deflections or distortions. Another design philosophy could be, well, maybe we want the structure to be flexible enough to handle those loads and allow us to um, easily manipulate it in the field. And these are you know, very two unique strategies. Um, another thing that, that is also prevalent is adjustable connections. And I think really the choice of, of each of these you know, design philosophies, as I you know, might coin it, um, the choice for which one really lies with understanding the cost and the performance of these. And so if you take a, a risk view of this, for instance, maybe a rigid structure um, requires more materials, so it's going to be more expensive to build. It also may have more risk because if you um, don't ensure that that structure is built accurately, it's more difficult to move things in place. So you might have a good design strategy that resists transportation and, and uh, erection loads, but if you lock in bad geometry during fabrication stages, um, then it becomes a lot more expensive to fix on site. And so, you know, I'm not going to come away with a slide by saying, you know, one of these strategies is best performing um, than the rest. But I think it's important to start to think of different approaches that tailor to your unique project. And so to kind of wrap up my, my talk here, I've seen dimensional control being used in sort of very siloed applications. And while this is, you know, um, often required, especially if, if you're dealing with kind of uh, firefighting on site, so to speak, I think that. My takeaway message is that dimensional control should really be a combination of strategies that exist across the life cycle. Um, keeping in mind that if you can come up with, with good designs that you know, allow you to avoid certain risks, that's obviously going to be great, but um, design alone is not going to solve dimensional control because at the end of the day, you're still building based off of that intention. And so there's really a need to look at kind of this life cycle view to it. And um, with that, I am at the end of my presentation and I, mm -hmm. I am thankful for your time and attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. We do have a couple questions for you, Chris. So the first one is, are you proposing to add a safety factor during design for changes required due to a dimension mismatch? As you said, there's a significant impact to correct the mismatch in dimension. And if I understand that is it, perhaps the question for the mismatch, um, would that be more so the site? I'm just I'm wondering if that's where the question is um uh let's assume on. so yeah yeah it's a good question so a safety factor um and i think that whether it, it comes out to being a safety factor um i think that it, it should be at least thought of um and i know that's kind of a um you know very trivial answer but if you can anticipate what your uh discrepancy between site tolerances and plant tolerances are then at least you have a way of, for instance, I mentioned grouting as one way that you can anticipate there being some kind of maybe gap or, or um, something that needs to be overcome and having a good you know, uh, procedure for, for handling that. Something as well as maybe you don't have discrete circular bolt holes in every application, maybe you have slotted connections. Um, and so I think it's difficult to um, answer whether or not a safety factor is, is brought in. Um, perhaps that safety factor is more from a structural standpoint, which I think we, we obviously anticipate, you know, we use safety factors to anticipate things like load eccentricities. Um, so uh, good question, but I'm, I'm not actually sure how to, how to best answer that. Fair enough. Okay, our next question is, do you see augmented reality as a valid reactive solution to dimensional control? Walk through the model off-site as it would be constructed on-site. Yeah, I think that, you know, this is something that I haven't seen used 
you know, in practice too much. Again, perhaps it's just limited to the applications that I've I've worked on. But I think that augmented reality is, is definitely a powerful tool. I think it could be both proactive and reactive. Um, you know, on one hand, I imagine if you were to scan your site and scan modules, you could, you know, um, use augmented reality to, to put those those two together. You could, for instance, um, take your preloaded modules that you maybe have more confidence are built more accurately and then use AR on site to virtually um, stack modules in place. So I think it's definitely uh, a tool that's going to be uh, coming to our industry either now or in the in the near future for sure. Lovely. Okay. Um, the next question is, what is your experience regarding temperature and tolerances to be taken into account at the moment of erecting a structure? Hmm. Yeah, this is a really interesting one because I think this, it's kind of twofold. When talking about temperature, I think you can talk about um, well distortion. My understanding, and I'm, I'm by, by no means a, a well distortion expert, um, although I have a, a good friend who's who's probably one of the the, the industry gurus on this topic. Um, I think that that temperature during the uh, welding process is something that absolutely absolutely needs to be factored in. Um, and I think too, like how you cool um, structures can affect distortion. But even as well, like let's say you're building in a, a heated factory that's kept at you know 60 degrees Fahrenheit and you're installing on a job site that's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, that temperature difference will obviously have a big um, impact on um, potentially how those modules uh, geometrically kind of exist between that, that, that warm environment and, and where you're going to install them. So um, I, I, I think that it is definitely a factor. And in some kind of rough calculations, I think that it can it can have you know a pretty significant um, impact you know on the order of of like a quarter to three quarters of an inch in some cases depending on what kind of you know um, system you're you're working on. But um, I haven't had too many direct experiences um, with it, but perhaps that's because the designs that I've I've seen and worked on were were really you know managed well and were able to control um, and anticipate and handle different kinds of uh, variability that could be introduced by this temperature um, topic. Yep, okay. We have another couple of questions here. One is um, how to approach this dimensional control issue when you don't develop the detailed engineering phase of the project? Yeah, uh, it's a really, really good thing because I think too, um, you know, one of the things that I talked about was that even if you do have a good you know, uh, design approach, you, there's still a need, I think, to have some, you know, toolkit of reactive strategy. So I think that that's my answer is that, you know, um, it's important to have uh, strategies that you can use that allow you to react to situations because, you know, that's going to be what gets your project done at the end of the day. You know, no matter how good your design intention is, if it's not executed properly or there's things you didn't anticipate, you need to, you need to fix those problems. So I think that every, you know, every everyone who's involved in, in on-site work should have, you know, a good toolkit of strategies that they can use um, and, and ideally have it kind of be pre-approved by um, engineers ahead of time, you know, um, rather than getting into a situation where um, there's there's miscommunication and, and even more rework because a solution that was derived in the field that, you know, was perceived to be okay, you know, wasn't from, from a different engineering standpoint. Um, yeah. Which I realize is challenging, but I think it, it at least should be thought of, and there should be some you know toolkit of strategies in place. So this could be a follow-on question to the temperature topic. It came in right as you were answering the temperature question. So I, let me know if this is just redundant or if this is another component. How do you account for the different conditions between the module fabrication location and installation location? And then he's talking again about temperature. Can you, can you repeat that one more time? Sure. How do you account for the different conditions between the module fabrication location and the installation location uh, regarding temperature? Yeah. So, like, let's say you are in that case where you know that temperature is going to cause um, a significant issue. Um, I think one approach is if you know, uh, you know, broadly speaking, ahead of time that you're going to have this issue. Um, perhaps what you do is is like let's say you're relying on your on your module to be you know a hundred I'm going to give a, a, an example let's say 20 feet long and you and you can get really reliable data that says that if you're building in a certain condition 
um, it's going to cause some sort of shrinkage. You know, you could a um, have something on site that can handle that, but you could, in some cases, um, design your module to be you know shorter and then just add shims on site rather than relying on building to that that dimension. And you know that in some cases it's going to cause issues. So maybe you approach it solely from the design standpoint that you say, well, we're going to design to the worst case scenario and then have a way that we can make up any any discrepancies that exist in the field. But uh, in my opinion, like it's it's really challenging to to do, and so you know you know another idea is perhaps what you do is you allow modules to get to the site temperature before you start setting. And most times, you know, if you're shipping it with a with a truck or or you know different kinds of transportation, it's probably going to be at that in situ temperature anyways. Uh, okay. But that could be something else, as you could um, allow it to cool or or you know heat um, before you set it. Okay. So here is an interesting question. What is your view on contractors who are engaged in process industries and large construction projects regarding their attitude to embracing dimensional tolerance strategies to prevent fixing compliance issues in the field? Yeah, I think what I'll I'd probably do is I draw on, on a non-modular application, but it's kind of prefabrication. Um, so I, I worked for a company that what we would do is we would go and scan buildings before architectural panels were put on. And I think that, you know, this is in many ways representative of, of kind of how we approach non-modular construction, probably even some parts of modular construction, um, where the last trade on site is, is, is the trade that has to inherit all of the problems that are introduced by everyone else. Um, and so I think in, in that application of, of, you know, where I worked, we would scan the building and understand you know, the position of doors and windows because that influences the ability to put architectural panels around it. Um, and in this application, you know, we brought technology into the mix to at least understand and to quantify and to be able to not always finger point. Um, I, I think that that's, you know, sometimes unfortunately we, we bring technology into the mix to be a contract, you know, liability um, tool or measure. But I think that if you want to have an effective, you know, construction management viewpoint, um, at the end of the day, you just need to have information that's going to help you solve a problem. And so I think technology plays a key role in, in at least just saying, hey, this is what we're looking at, you know, and rather than relying on very conventional approaches to measurement, which is like a tape measure or a plumb bob. Um, so bringing in, you know, a bit of, of uh, you know, additional uh, tools to help get that information can at least be a good starting point. And then I think that, you know, if depending on, on what part of the, the project you're involved in, if you've got good historical data to say, hey, look, at, because we built inaccurately, we're having these issues now, um, at least having that, that benchmark to see, or, or, you know, tracking those problems and viewing it in, in, the, in the, the lens of dimensional control can at least be used as a communication mechanism uh, going forward, you know, so we can, you know, share lessons learned. Sounds good. I don't good. know if I answered the question, but I... I think so. Uh, Hopefully. To preamble or uh, on and off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we do have an attendee who says that they have suffered from some issues um, inserting the laser scan at the wrong location in the model, hence leading to wrong coordinates in the field. They're wondering if there's any recommendations or checklists available on using some digital tech like a laser scan um, because they have different tolerances. Yeah, I think the answer is probably. Um, you might be, you know, I, I'd advise you to consult with, you know, companies out there that provide that type of information. Perhaps you're working with them already. Um, before answering that question, I think one of the things that uh, I'm, unfortunately you tend to see is just because you use technology and, and you get information does not mean that you're using that technology properly. And I'm not saying that in your um, situation or context, but um, in my, you know, view, there's a lot of factors that go into when you collect a laser scan to ensure that it's actually representative of what you're um, doing. Just, just because the, the manufacturer states a level of accuracy does not mean that the insights that you get are accurate or you know this, that, or the other. And so I think one of the things that I've seen over time is um, in kind of working on, on quality control processes is to maintain a very healthy view of what you can realistically achieve with um, a laser scanner. And more times than not, I tend to use laser scanning to get three-dimensional information, and that's one thing that you can't really get using more accurate um, discrete point measurements. So things like a laser tracker or a total station, you know, might be able to provide increased accuracy on, on very specific points. And so my recommendation might be to um, 
consult or even purchase a laser tracker to get really key and accurate information where you absolutely need it and then fill in the gap with the the lidar data or the laser scan data because it'll give you three-dimensional data you can't really get from anything else but again yeah, i think yeah. that perhaps addressing those specific needs it's probably best addressed in in consulting with a company that that you know uses this technology on a on an ongoing basis and can kind of speak to and assist you he also noted that sometimes uh an issue can be when you're when you're scanning a running pipe which is hot and it has expansion in its length and then it gets cold and it physically alters the you know it's it's a change in the dimension so i think yeah you've answered right. that one uh, one thing one thing i i was also going to note on that is i think that i've seen a lot of value in in taking measurements along the whole uh life cycle of a of a uh, a product and and that kind of speaks to that benchmarking and the process capabilities but you know, a, a good example is taking scans before and after a process that involves heat, like welding, and understanding what what's happening. And so, the more data collection you can do, perhaps not for every single product, but at least on on sort of a pilot or or a prototype that you're pushing through, or just the first product, taking more data at least is just going to help you get um, potential insights into you know what part of that yeah. process is either introducing problems or not. Okay, I also have, is there anyone actively using your combined recommendations on a project? In other words, is there a project that can be reviewed as an example of putting dimensional control techniques to use in a practical setting? So most of the, the research that I've done on this side has been more, um, you know, documenting what, what specific companies have done. Um, one company that has developed a really, really robust dimensional control approach is Z-Modular, and I think part of that is, is just the uh, approaches to, you know, some of the proprietary technologies that they've used um, to ensure that, that their modules stack properly, but also the culture and the mindset there of, of good quality control. Um, and I, I, I say that as, as having been an employee of, of Z-Modular, but they, they are um, definitely a great case of, of, you know, a company who, who takes dimensional control very seriously. Um, Perhaps it's not pertinent to to all of CII um, applications because they're they're you know, in the residential and commercial space, but um, they're definitely a company that that has um, figured out how to get good um, quality control. Thank you. Okay, we have another question coming in. What training and skill set do you recommend project owners should look for in dimensional control service providers? Any specific certifications uh, that are available for personnel performing such control? and using modern measuring tools? Hmm. It's a great question. I don't think I have a, a direct answer. I think in my experience, where we've had to use kind of third-party uh, measurement companies, the things that uh, I look for are the kinds of work that they are involved in on a day-to-day -day basis, because it's often probably not um, on your kind of project. And I think that, you know, like for instance, if you are bringing a, uh, a company that performs laser tracking services, they're, they're probably gonna be um, quite busy with automotive lines or um, different types of manufacturing environments. And so having at least some conversations with them, um, they're, they're probably going to have all of in, their own internal certifications. I'm not sure exactly what those are, um, as well as all devices should be certified on an ongoing basis. Again, I'm not 100% uh, sure of what those you know specific certifications are, but I would just recommend, um, you know, do your homework and at least have some, um, you know, talk uh, discussions with them to understand that they can do what you're um, setting out to do. And I mean, you could also just bring in multiple um, contractors or third party providers to get, you know, different perspectives on things. Um, so yeah, that would be my kind of um, reply to that in not knowing, you know, what the okay. actual industry certifications are. Fair enough. Okay, we're down to about three or four minutes left, so we'll take a, a couple more. And if we don't get to your questions today live, um, Chris has offered uh, to respond to you via email um, throughout the end of the week here. So uh, we will get back to you if we don't get it today. Uh, so here's another question. When selecting technology for the dimensional control, would it be in the same or different? Oh, I'm sorry. Will it be the same or different for yard fabrication and field stick build installation? Say datums for the field and laser scanner for the yard, for example. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of technology and um, systems that can, can span both. 
um, but there's also ones that are very specific. So I'll go to the laser tracker, for instance. Um, they tend to require kind of an environmental setup, and so I haven't seen them being used, you know, in the field. Um, whereas, and I think that this is part of the problem that we have in modular construction is that, you know, the the dimensional control strategies that we um, come up with and the technologies we use are based on what is currently being used in non-modular applications. And so we have to figure out, you know, how to either get improvements to those to get it more accurate or to, you know, wait for or work with companies to develop new tech. Um, so the datum side, I think it, it's it's obviously pertinent to offsite or uh, the manufacturing environment, but that same mentality absolutely needs to apply to the field um, as well. So that would be, you know, my quick answer to that. Um, the the laser scanning, I've seen it, I've seen it work, you know, in both environments. The thing that I would kind of point to is that there are different types of scanners that perform better in indoor versus outdoor environments, as well as if you're scanning your overall assembly in the field and it's much bigger. And so you probably would just want to make sure that you're sourcing your um, technologies and they're capable of doing what you want to achieve. Perfect. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. Do adjustable connections withstand the rigors of transport as well as a rigid structure? I think it's very um, application specific. And if we're talking about like, a, you know, an industrial pipe spool rack, it's probably very different than for a small bathroom pod. Um, more times than not, I think adjustable connections are probably not impacted um, by transportation. Um, but I could see that if, you know, you use your adjustable connections to simultaneously be your lifting, um, you know, rings, then, then yeah, like that has to be thought of. Um, so I think really it, it depends and it's very application specific, but um, I would say more times than not, uh, your structure, um, you know, rigidity is, and I've seen it actually happen where it's designed to, to, you know, and it needs to be increased specifically for transportation loads, but there tends to be a lot of assumptions and kind of um, that safety factor comes into, into the picture. So, um, you know, my gut would be that designing a rigid structure is probably required, um, whether it's the structure or even just temporary bracing um, to resist to, to resist transportation and, and handling loads. And then your adjustable connections, you know, could be a result of just correcting and, and making up the difference for the structure because of transportation loads or just even bad fabrication work too. Fair enough, thank you, Chris. Well, thank you all for your wonderful questions. I know we didn't get to quite a few, but uh, we will circle back with you very soon. Um, thank you all for your attention today. We know you're all very busy. We do appreciate you carving out time today to join us for our webinar, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Chris, thank you for your knowledge and for sharing it with our, our viewers and, and attendees today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I uh, really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Of course, we'll see you next time. Everyone enjoy your, your evening, your afternoon, your, your morning, wherever you are around the globe. We thank you for tuning in today and we'll see you next time. Take care.